the PMC, Pennsylvania Military College, was established in 1821 to prepare young men for entry into the armed services. The PMC was the first school to receive federal arms for training, and the cadets became renowned for their leadership, scholarship, and military service to their country. The Pennsylvania Military College eventually became our wide university, and to this day we value its history and continually remember those before us. The Communications Department is honored to present Voices from Freedom, where alumni from the Pennsylvania Military College have the opportunity to reflect on some of their favorite memories from this pivotal point in their lives. Hello and welcome to Voices of Freedom. I'm Josh Miskey and I'm proud to be the host for this year's show featuring the Pennsylvania Military College class of 1971. We're pleased to be doing this show for you guys today for the first time in two years, and we're excited to have a live audience with us for the first time. We're pleased to be joined by four members of the PMC class of 1971. If they could please introduce themselves and state their cadet numbers. Jeff Dieno, cadet number 17. Rich Flores, 534. I can't remember my phone number, but I can remember my cadet number. <laughs> Kevin McHale, number 269. Wayne Smee, number 337. Once again, guys, thanks for joining us. Um, we've got a few questions here for you today. Uh, and then when I ask a question, I'm going to ask it to Jeff first, and then we'll kind of go down the line. And then if you guys want to add on to something that somebody else said, feel free to. But that's going to be the general order. And then once we get through these questions, there's going to be some questions from the audience at the end. So I hope we have a good time today. OK. You guys ready? All right, let's do it. All right, so the first question is, how did you hear about PMC and what made you decide to attend school here? I lived about six or seven miles from here in Ridley Park and my minister uh, was the chaplain for the college. And so when it came time to start applying to colleges, uh, he really pushed me to apply to PMC. Um, I didn't understand at the time uh, that there was a Pennsylvania Military College and a Penn Morton College, so I started out my freshman year at Penn Morton College. Um, I'm from Reading, Pennsylvania, so it was fairly nearby, and I was an Army brat and interested in an uh, Army career, so I was looking at um, mainly military colleges, and this was the closest one. I had expressed an interest in going to military school. My high school guidance counselor, I, I grew up in upstate New York, put me in contact with uh, Mr. Guthrie, who was an admissions uh, recruiter in upstate New York. I met with him. He invited me down for a campus visit, and I liked everything I saw, so I applied here. I'm originally from York, Pennsylvania, and uh, when I was a senior in high school, I. Uh, applied to two colleges, got accepted at both of them. The acceptance from PMC came first, so that's where I ended up. I think basically the way that I uh, chose PMC to be one of the colleges I've applied to was being from Pennsylvania. I just went down the list of Pennsylvania schools, saw Pennsylvania Military College, and said, eh, uniforms and stuff, that might be cool. Wayne, what high school did you go to? York Suburban High School. I, I went to Northern York, so I'm oh. from York County as well. Good to, good to see you down here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so once you guys decided that you were going to come to the PMC, were your parents uh, supportive of that decision? Yes, very much so. Um, you know, that was a, my dad was a World War II veteran, so when I told him that uh, I liked what I saw from across the street at the Cadet Corps, uh, that I really wanted to make the change from Penn Morton to Pennsylvania Military College, uh, both of my parents were, were delighted, even though it increased the cost of uh, college about double. Um, my parents were very supportive. My dad was a longtime Army officer and had been a professor at West Point, so he thought it was a great idea for me to go to military school. My parents were, were very supportive. Uh, they were happy that I had gotten, in, gotten into a college that I really wanted to go to, that it was my choice, and they supported that. Yeah, I think my parents were supportive. Um, my, mom, my brother, my older brother was in the Marines at the time, and so I don't think my mom was too keen on me also following in a military situation. But uh, yeah, they, were, they were supportive of me going to college, yeah. 
So when you first got here, uh, I guess Rook would be the name for a freshman student. What was it like as a Rook when you were here? Well, of course, I observed the Rook class um, from the Penn Morton side, and I, and I kind of, for whatever reason, really liked what I saw, and that's why the next year I, I wanted to make the transfer. Uh, when I did go through the actual Rook program, um, I think it was more than I expected, but uh, somehow got through it, and uh, glad I did. And the thing I was surprised about the most was when we first got here, and our parents were with us, everyone was very polite and cordial. And uh, then the parents left, and we were in our individual rooms, and I think they said, Charlie Company, step out. And all of a sudden, everybody wasn't so nice. And that's when things started. Uh, beginning, the first day when you're here as a rook, the, it was probably one of the strongest memories I have, is that you really didn't know what you were getting into. You know, you're starting college, and that's an experience in itself. You've elected to do a school where you're basically spending your first nine months here in recruit training as a, as a boot camp. And with very few exceptions, you don't know a soul your first day here. You fast forward four years later, and now you're in amongst a good group of people that you like. You're a college graduate. Most of our classmates were commissioned. Uh, and Vietnam was still very much active. So we were going on to the next part of our life. So the, the first day you're here as a rook and the last day you leave after graduation were two very momentous dichotomies in your life. Yeah, I can remember one of the first nights in the first week of, uh, of rook year, lying in the rack thinking, what the hell am I doing here? Uh, but I've always been someone, I think, I've always been someone to finish what I started, so there was no way that I wasn't going to complete it. So we kind of sort of got into this already, so what would a typical day at PMC be like for a student? It started off miserably. Um, <laughs> somebody would have to go out into the corridor and start telling us how much time it was until what the formation out in front of Old Main, what uniform we were going to wear, um, once you got all that done and you got out there, um, Reveille, and then we marched into the uh, dining hall for breakfast, then back to the, the room, and, and somewhere along the line, the room got cleaned, the beds got made, um, and then off to classes, and uh, in class all day long. And then at the end of the day, if you happen to be in an activity, whether it be athletics or uh, something that the cadet corps had going on, like Pershing rifles or Ranger platoon, uh, you went off and did that. Um, if you weren't a, a stellar cadet, you might have to go and walk your tours uh, at that time. And then formation again in the evening uh, for retreat and then march to dinner. After dinner, back to the room, and then it was basically a study, study, study until lights out. And the, probably the two most memorable things as a rook were obviously getting up early, which I didn't have to do when I was just a civilian, uh, going out in the cold uh, up around the Old Main uh, for formation, uh, and then spending a lot of time in trouble with something I said to somebody. Um, would you brace around the hallway and usually get caught for doing something that you didn't know you weren't supposed to be doing. And that was pretty much the way that a lot of your day started. And it ended that way because after study hours, didn't they used to call us out? And that's when fun and games started. We would uh, low crawl down the highway or down the hallways. And did, remember a green chair that we had to sit in a green, all kinds of stuff. But that was interesting. Yeah, after after uh, mandatory study hours were over at nine o'clock and then lights out at ten, and that hour in between was your chaos hour. I can remember playing playing a game called high water, low water. You know, the, the the cadre would tell you high water, and everything in your room and everything in your locker had to go on the upper bunk, and then they'd call you out, and you <clears throat> then they'd say low water, and then you had to take everything off your lower bunk, uh, off your upper bunk, and put it on the lower bunk. Now your room was completely trashed, and at, 
at 2200 hours, it was lights out. So you had to put your room back together in the dark because they were gonna come by and inspect it the next morning and everything had to be perfectly in its place. So that, not that 2100 to 2200 hour period was, was chaos. And, and oh, by the way, you probably had an exam to study for the next day too. Yeah, I can't add much more than what they've already mentioned, except Kevin was talking about the games that we played. I remember one of them called Dress Valley Forge, where you had to take every single piece of uniform that you had and put it on at one time. So uh, I'm going to go a little bit out of the order here, because Jeff mentioned walking tours, and we were talking about this before the show started, because I wasn't sure what a walking tour was. Um, but the question that this came in was, do you recall receiving demerits and walking tours while at PMC? So if someone wants to explain what a walking tour is and then maybe answer the question. <laughs> Jim Hogue, are you out there? <laughs> Jim Hogue gave me my first tour. <clears throat> he was cadre on my floor when I was a freshman and we were making noise or something like that and he came in and gave me a tour. A tour was when you had to walk one hour up and down the sidewalk in front of Howell Hall in full dress uniform with your rifle. Um, and one tour was one hour walking. That was the only tour I got, Jim, thank you. <laughs> I don't remember getting tours, honestly, except my senior year, uh, a couple of us did something that, gee, I can't remember what it was, but it was obviously frowned upon by the commandant's staff, and so we were given, I guess you would call it house arrest. Uh, we didn't walk tours, we just had to stay in our room for an hour or so. Did anybody else have one that they wanted to talk I'm about? I'm sure I walked tours, but that's one of my memory lapses now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, uh, although I know Dan Gascoigne tried to catch me a few times uh, unsuccessfully, so uh, I escaped that. So what was life like for you on the weekends? Was there like some social life that you did on the weekends? Did you go home for the weekends? Did you stay here? Well, your freshman year, you, if the football game was at home, you went to the football game. Um, you marched um, and then sat in the stands and watched the game. Um, when you were an upperclassman, um, pretty much weekends you had a lot of free time and Living so close, I would actually go home and maybe take a, a, a couple of my classmates with me. Uh, I, I played a couple of sports here, so my schedule was usually pretty busy. If we weren't playing somebody on a weekend, um, I'd try to go home once we were upperclassmen. Um, but the schedule was really pretty busy all the time, so it was a nice break to be able to get away and get some home cooking. The food stunk, by the way. I see nothing has changed sometimes. You might ask some Widener students out here, they say the food isn't that great these days. I don't know. That's, that's just what I've heard. But <laughs> yeah. what sports did you play, Rich, when you were here? Uh, soccer and tennis, and I also wrestled for one year. I, I lived too far away to go home on the weekend, so I stayed on campus. Um, <clears throat> but you also had uh, your military training on Saturday, or inspections on Saturday morning, so your weekend didn't start till noon or one o'clock. Uh, and then you could always uh, go over to what's now the University Center, McMoreland Center, uh, sit in the canteen there. Uh, but you pretty much, especially in your rookie year, you pretty much hibernated to stay out of the way of the upperclassmen. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, rookie year, we, didn't even, we weren't even allowed to go home until before Thanksgiving. Um, but I do remember, I think it was rookie year that some Saturday afternoons, we actually ventured downtown to Chester. Uh, you could almost do that at, that at that time. They did tell us, you know, if you're going down to Chester, don't go alone. Go in groups of eight, nine, ten. Uh, and uh, was the Mac Theater we went to? Movies at the Mac? <laughs> but, but afternoon, Saturday afternoons, rookie year, that was kind of a, uh, a privilege, if you will, to, uh, to go downtown Chester. Uh, so I mentioned uh, sports for Rich because I followed up on that. Did any of you other guys play sports or have another uh, club or something that you were involved in while you were here? Yeah, I ran cross country my first year and then um, did the uh, Ranger platoon the remaining three years. Kevin, 
Yeah, I was, I was in the Ranger platoon with Jeff, and uh, we did small unit tactics and went to Indian Town Gap and Fort Dix for some exercises against other ROTC units. So that was, a, that was always a good outlet. I uh, wrestled intramural three times. I won three times, but after the third time, I said, that's it, I'm done. Uh, actually, uh, I didn't really participate in too many uh, team sports uh, inter or intercollegiate sports, but ironically, I ended up my senior year being the A&R officer, which is athletics and recreation. I pretty much ran the intramural program for the entire Corps in my senior year. So what events uh, in the calendar year at PMC were the most memorable to you guys? I think uh, the first one that stood out was going to the, what we called the Little Army Navy game at the Atlantic City Convention Center uh, for a football game against uh, the Merchant Marine Academy. Um, that was always a highlight. Um, the formal dances that we had here were, were a good time also. Some of the uh, special parades that we were involved in, the one I always remember is Mother's Day because we wore whites and um, our mothers usually came down and we gave them flowers and it was a big deal. But a lot of events that we had in the springtime especially. I remember uh, in, I think it was October, we used to march in the Pulaski Day Parade, which started up in the northern part of Chester and went, I think, halfway to Wilmington. We marched and then you had to march back and in our senior year, it rained and we didn't even take our, our raincoats with us and we were soaked by the time we got back. That was always a good experience. <clears throat> yeah, I can't really add too much to what they said. Uh, being alphabetically at the end here, I kind of uh, cede to them for <laughs> this. So um, obviously we talked a little bit at the beginning about how while you guys were in school, the Vietnam War was obviously going on, and that wasn't a very popular war among some people. So did that sentiment in the public ever affect you when you were in school or thereafter? The first time it affected me was my uh, junior year when we had the first draft lottery, and my birthday came up number nine. So I knew that I'd made the right choice to enroll in ROTC uh, because it was pretty obvious that uh, we were all going to be going to Vietnam. My number was 317, um, so I probably would not have gone, but I had already volunteered. Um, the one thing that when you were talking about the questions, I don't remember a lot of personal conflicts with either friends that I knew or people that I ran into. Uh, when I would go home on the train in uniform, I always waited for people to make comments but I don't recall anybody ever saying anything. I mean, we were sensitive to it, but I just don't remember it. Uh, I think Vietnam was a, it was a lot of turmoil. Kent State, uh, the incident at Kent State was why we were here. And uh, the whole four years we were here, Vietnam loomed very large. My number was, my number was 328, but like Rich, I was already committed to, uh, to going into the Marine Corps. Uh, <clears throat> but I can remember I can remember when they did the first lottery. It was on TV, prime time, 8 p.m. They drew the numbers based, they drew your date of birth, and that was your number, and that's when you were going to get drafted. I can remember that because the, uh, <clears throat> a lot of guys had TVs, and seniors had TVs in the room, but everybody kind of crowded around. When you heard the low numbers called, you could hear wailing in the, in, the, in the dorms as guys' numbers got called. And as you got higher up, there was more gleeful cheers when you know, they got a high number. And the next morning at formation, I can remember there was three or four seniors who were in ROTC but had gotten high numbers and knew they weren't going to get drafted. They showed up to formation in civilian clothes. And that was, they were done. They were, they were out. I have them all beat. I had 338. Uh, my cadet number is 337. I had 338. Um, as I mentioned before, my older brother was in the Marines. He was in Vietnam at the time. And my mother said, 
if you don't have to go, I'd appreciate it. And so I, uh, I listened to my mother. Uh, I was one of those um, who knew that I wasn't going to get drafted. I wasn't one of those who showed up in civilian clothing. Um, I did not complete ROTC, but I did complete, I did four years in the cadet corps. I do not regret that. Biggest regret that I have today is that I did not serve in uniform. Um, but as far as the Vietnam whole situation is concerned, I do remember that I had friends who attended Penn Morton College. We were friends. I don't think that, at least from my perspective, there was much conflict between Pennsylvania Military College and, and the civilian students at Penn Morton. As a matter of fact, I remember when Kent State happened, there were some students from other local colleges who tried to come onto campus, tried to create problems, and I think we stood united, uh, both Penn Morton and Penn Military students. So how well did the military program here uh, teach you to be a, uh, prepare you to be a leader outside of this? And what lessons did you learn in that leadership area while you were here? Oh, it was, it, it was totally uh, made my life on active duty much easier, particularly at the very beginning as a second lieutenant. I mean, the fact that you just knew how to wear a uniform was a big deal. Um, but then, you know, you build on that training that you received here, and I ended up staying uh, 30 years in the Army, um, and it's all because of what I learned uh, at this institution. I think just the routine of, for the first time, you think about you're going from a high school where there's no focus of anything, and there's no dis sense of discipline, and all of a sudden there's a routine to everything you do, everything you think about, um, everything we learned. You had to be pretty focused and disciplined. You were going to be in big trouble if you didn't do the things you were supposed to do. And I think that that had a lot of benefit, both for when I went on active duty in the Army, and then later on when I owned my own business. I think it really helped a lot. Yeah, I think the, especially in your rook year, the, the first thing you learned was how to follow. <clears throat> and that became very important. And as you graduated and got more responsibility as a cadet, then you learned how to be a leader. But I think that learning how to be a follower, learning how to uh, give, gave you more empathy when you became the leader. I think that one of the things I really took away was how to be a follower first and then how to be a leader. And again, not having a military career, my time at PMC was not wasted. Uh, the, the discipline, the leadership skills uh, certainly helped me through my civilian career. If, would you say you had a defining moment when you were here? And if you did, what was it? I think for me it was um, at commissioning. It, it finally hit me. I remember sitting there um, and all kinds of thoughts go through your mind. But I'm actually gonna be commissioned a second lieutenant. I'm going on active duty. Uh, I'm graduating from college. All these things are coming in at one time. And there was a big unknown out there. I, I mean, I knew I was going to Fort Benning, Georgia for a basic course. But other than that, I wasn't really sure uh, what the future held. I, I th a lot of ways, the same thing. Um, I think of our rook year when we first started, and there's the jolt of it. And then the next thing I think of is graduation, where suddenly we go from a little bit of a cocoon here and being protected, and then suddenly facing real life. Um, I had to report to my first duty station eight days later, um, and that was kind of a jolt, just suddenly realizing I wasn't going to be at school anymore. Well, besides the tour that Jimmy Hogue uh, gave me as a learning experience, may maybe the man I am today, is that what you said, Jim? <clears throat> uh, in my senior year, I also met my wife, and we've been married for 48 years, and we dated through my senior year, so that was a, a defining moment for me. Uh, but uh, much like Jeff said, when, you know, when you're sitting there and you're, you're getting commissioned, I got commissioned in the Marine Corps, it was, you know, you had, like I said earlier, Vietnam was looming in back of you, but now you're going to go out of this cocoon. You're going to now you now life is going to start to get real, uh, and that was kind of the the step off point. 
Yeah, basically graduation was my aha moment. Uh, it, it, four years here were, for the most part, comfortable and cocoon, yeah. Uh, it, it was a world unto its own. Uh, it, was, it was your home. And then all of a sudden you graduated and now there's a bigger place out there and you got bigger responsibilities. All right, so I, that was all the questions that they gave me. I had a couple that I wrote down myself. Um, so one of the questions that I wrote down was, I think most all of you had some, at least one deployment in a foreign country. So my question would be, what did you learn when you were being in, a con in another country? And uh, what was it like being there? Um, being in Italy, for instance, a beautiful country, but you really learn that this is the greatest country in the world. Um, we have so much freedom here that we just take for granted. And my counterparts in the Italian army did not have the same freedoms I had, even though it's a, you know, a democratic society, a member of NATO and European Union, uh, it, it's different. It, it, it's hard to explain, but um, this is such a, much greater experience living in this country than I would say in a foreign country. Um, I was, de my deployment was uh, to Thailand and obviously it was easy duty, but at the same time, just being in another culture for over a year uh, and realizing how great our country was and also how much most people in the world a lot of people really look up to the United States and see what our leadership is. And I know a lot of the people around us when where I was kind of had that attitude. Yeah, I've had an opportunity to travel a lot. In fact, I, I tell people I've had McDonald's in 18 different countries. So, <clears throat> and I agree, Jeff and Rich said, you, know, you really take for granted what you have in this country until you go to another country and you see you, you make that comparison. And there are some countries that are on a par with the United States, but there's no, nowhere else uh, do we have the quality of life that we really have here. And uh, I think that's particularly poignant now with what you see going on in Ukraine where uh, these things we take for granted uh, every day in this country. And we just, you know, you really have to be grateful for it. I've been to Canada. Uh, but I, I've traveled exp extensively in this country, and there's still so much that I haven't seen, <clears throat> and I would really like to uh, see more of the United States uh, and appreciate what we do have here. So I know from the uh, bio you sent, Jeff, you did a lot of work in the NATO uh, Ukraine policy, NATO Russia, NATO uh, European Union. So I saw that and was like, wow, that's pretty... Uh, relevant to what we're doing today, just in general, and Kevin just said it, like that's some crazy stuff that's going on there. So what kind of work, when you were involved in that area, were you doing and how did it relate to what's going on there today? Yeah, this was back in, um, let's see, 93 to 96 when I was on the Joint Staff. And uh, then again, when I went back as a, as a civilian, uh, in 2001, um, we were kind of working to get Ukraine into NATO membership, which unfortunately more than half of their uh, population did not support. We were also trying to get more dialogue with Russia, not to get them to be a NATO member, but to at least to get some cooperation with them. We would do training exercises with them on a very small scale. Um, exchange students for military schools. Our chiefs of defense, our chairman, their chief of defense, um, would meet twice a year, just trying to keep up this conversation, which now today is absolutely, there is no conversation. Uh, we've lost everything that we, we tried to work towards uh, years ago. So from your experience there and what you learned about those countries that are involved in that. What would you say is something that most of us don't know about what's going on there that you think we should know about? 
I think with uh, social media, uh, you know as much as just about anybody in the Pentagon knows right now. Um, I have to tell you, uh, there wasn't too many surprises when <laughs> I would read something that was uh, important one day and see it on the front page of the Washington Post the next day. So I, I don't think there's anything that, that you don't know if you've been following this whole thing on social media or in the press. It's the digital world we live in, I guess. It's a good, it's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, one final thing before I turn it over to the audience questions here. Um, do you guys know of any PMC traditions that you did that the ROTC here today is now carried on what they, what they do? Um, well, I mean, in the, at homecoming with the, the broom drill, um, they have the color guard. We always had a color guard when we, when we would do that. Um, they uh, have gone on some um, exercises to places where we used to exercise. So I think some of those traditions still stand. Other than the fact that they should be getting up early in the morning, as we did. Um, now, I think some of the extracurricular activities, I know they have battery robinette. I guess they still have, and some of the outdoor activities. And if you go to summer camp, it, we went to Indian Town Gap for most of the summer or junior year. I think some of that stuff is helpful no matter where you are. Yeah, you know, one of the things, I don't know whether they still do it or not. I know they, you associate with ROTC units in the area. Um, do you do any exchanges or any uh, symposiums with the military academies? We used, to have, we used to have military weekend where they would come here, we would have a formal ball, but it also gave us an opportunity to kind of compare our our college experience with West Point, Naval Academy, Air Force Academy, Norwich, Citadel. Uh, so that gave us a perspective of other military schools. Uh, so if there's something that can be done along that line. I don't know if they do this <clears throat> today or not, but one of the things that was just very, very important to me was never walking on the school seal. Uh, and I don't even know if, if they're still here. There was one in the uh, I guess that's the admissions building, it used to be the library. Um, but you just didn't, you didn't do it. And to this day, if I visit any place or another college or any place that I see something like that on the ground, I, you know, I walk around it. I don't, it's just respect. And so I don't know if that's a tradition that's continued or not. If it's not, I'd like to see it. <laughs> All right, so we have one of our cadets here, Jacob Fisher, who's going to uh, facilitate some audience questions. Um, we'll see what they come up with out there. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cadet Jacob Fisher, and we're just going to take the next couple minutes to open up the floor for any questions that you might have for these gentlemen up here. By the way, this is a scary part of the program. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cadet Starkey, everyone. How you doing? I'm Cadet Starkey. Uh, my question is, how is the weather in Fort Indian Town Gap? Because every time we go around, it's, it's not good at all. It was great while I was there. But remember, we didn't have global warming then, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, there we go. Uh, I'm from the class of 70. I'm surprised that no one made mention of the infamous square meals that we used to eat in, uh, in McMorland Center, if that was impacted the way you uh, diet or eat your meals these days. <laughs> I, w I will say that not so much the square meal, but I find myself regularly sitting on the first six inches of the chair. Well, often we didn't get a lot to eat because they were busy discussing things with us while we ate and, and also asking tri senseless trivia and other sorts of things. So I don't remember how much weight I lost the first couple months, but I think it was fairly significant. It, it gave me an appreciation for now when, when uh, 
when you can't eat a regular meal, and if you do think back on it every once in a while and you say, you know, how did I not lose too much weight when I was not eating a meal? Uh, having to answer, you know, very inquiring questions from upperclassmen. <clears throat> it, it also made me not want to be a waiter when I grew up. <clears throat> any other questions from the audience? Or any comments that anybody would like to add? Or Lost our cadet. So I know that, oh wow, it's loud. Um, I know that we have our OCPs and we call them like operational camouflage pattern. Did you guys have any uniforms that you called differently? Because I know you had different uniforms. Fatigues. Fatigues, yeah. Yeah, our, our, our fatigues when we were here were just plain green, one color. Olive drought. If you, olive, watch, if you watched MASH, that's pretty much yeah. <laughs> what we wore. Yeah, and, and then we, we wore them a little neater than, yeah, than they do on MASH, but yeah. Straight olive drab. Um, and our, each uniform had a name, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, so that would indicate what that uniform was. When those guys used to call the minutes in the morning, they'd say today's uniform is dress Charlie or whatever we were supposed to be wearing at that time. But as they said, uh, fatigues in those years were all pretty much the same. They were heavier than what you guys have. And in fact, even when you went overseas, surprisingly enough, they were still pretty heavy and pretty hot. And when you wore, when you wore your uh, fatigues here, they were usually starched up to the point where the, the creases were still in them. Um, and if, if you wore them for too long, you know, when you put them on, you'd actually put your leg into the pants and it, You'd be, they call it a breaking starch because it would, it would open up the pant leg. And then, it, then you'd walk around straight legged all the time because you didn't want to take the crease out of it. That's right, I forgot that. Any other questions? No, no, she's uh -oh. not allowed. Uh -oh. <laughs> That's my, that's my Immaculata wife that's going to Yes. Be I was going to say, I, I heard, um, know that there was a lot of strict things. Ones that you could share. What is one of your funniest moments for the four years you were there that you can share with us? I, I was uh, actively involved in, I guess today it's called Theater Widener. We call it a Theater PMC. Uh, and so, I don't know if, I think it was funny, but if you could picture me wearing a bald wig, I played Pappy Yoakum in the musical Little Abner. Uh, but I, I was, that was one of the fun things for me, was being actively involved in the theater organization. There was one incident in my, our senior year where uh, a group of uh, co-eds from Immaculata College came down and we were the upperclassmen. We had, we had, various dating uh, schemes, and they uh, opened the door and let loose into our first floor dorm room, dorm hallway, a, a box full of little chickens and little ducks. And they all had little signs around them. I was the corps commander, so my, my duck had signs that said, cheap, cheap, I'm the chief. Uh, <clears throat> and they had little, little signs that they, and then they jumped in the car and took off. And, I, I don't, to this day, I don't remember what happened to those poor little ducks, but that was, that was a prank that was played on us that we enjoyed. My only thing that I would say about funny incidents was unfortunately, I had a little bit of a warped sense of humor. And uh, when I was a rook, and we'd be standing out in the hall and getting harassed and stuff, invariably I'd start laughing because they just thought it was funny. And that was the worst thing you could do to cadre is laugh at them. And they would come up and start on you. And it didn't teach me a lesson because I continued to do it as long as I was a rook. It was just a good time. Are you having a good time? Yes, sir. <laughs> I think getting ready for room inspection was always a little bit crazy and hilarious because you would work really hard to get everything cleaned and shined and and the bed pulled tight so that you could bounce a quarter off of it. And sure enough, the inspecting officer would come in with a white glove, 
and you forgot the top of the door and he has dust all over his hand and you knew that that just meant that you weren't going to be going anywhere too far that weekend. I can when I was when I was a junior, they <clears throat> I learned very quickly that the I was on cadre and the rooks that I had just were not good at cleaning their rooms. So I learned after the first time I did a room inspection that I would do a white glove inspection, but I would use their glove and not my glove. <clears throat> I have a question. So there's a lot of collective wisdom up there and Careers, yes, there are. Don't shake your head. Is somebody no. else coming up? <laughs> Is there another group here? What would you say as advice to the young people who are here today who are pretty much following in your step, footsteps now? What advice do you have? Stick with it. This, you have a really great opportunity. Do it and stay with it. You'll, you'll love it. I'd say soak up all the information and everything around you and don't be afraid to laugh at what's happening, as a matter of fact, but there's going to be things that are tough and just laugh them off and go to the next thing because you're going to learn from everything that happens. There's a saying over in the, audit, in the uh, museum from Colonel Hyatt that talks about you know, when, when something is lost, nothing is lost. The last line on there, when character is lost, everything is lost. So you're, you're, you're building up your resume right now as a student, but um, keep your character intact and uh, it will take you a long way. Do what you like. Um, I mentioned before that I'm someone who finishes things that I like, you know, I don't quit. But on the other hand, if you think going in another direction works for you, go ahead, try it. But do what you like. Thank you, gentlemen, for those pieces of advice. And got another question? Oops. Hi, so I play on the men's basketball team here at Widener, and uh, like some days we have to like get up early, and it's something like your guys' rigorous schedule, but, but sometimes, like, some people show up late, and then we get punished for that. So I was wondering, throughout your guys' uh, career, early days of waking up, was there ever anybody that was, like, late, and would you guys get punished for that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, all, all the time. Group punishment was the, uh, was the theme song around here. I mean, if one person fell out, then everybody was going to end up falling out. So, yeah, there were... All for one, one for all. <laughs> but but that was also that was also the learning point of you're a team now. You're not an individual. The team is only as good as the as the weakest link. Um, so if you have a chronic member, um, your your influence over that individual to get them to show up on time is going to be a lot more impactful than the coaches. <clears throat> and and you also learn not to leave anybody behind. Uh, that brings a, a point to my next question. I wanted to know if, um, you know, what did you do to uh, correct those actions? I know nowadays they have the uh, soap sock party where they'll catch you in the dorms after, but uh, was there anything you could share on <laughs> how to influence your fellow members? Share? <laughs> I, I would say that you, 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 have those, you have those things that you do that are kind of like these immediate action drills to try to get the individual to pay attention. But <clears throat> your example and your long-term influence over that individual to try to get them to correct their behavior is probably going to be more to shape that individual in the long term. Uh, you know, if you, if you give them a pink belly or you give them a shower party or something like that to, to wake them up, that, that gets their attention. But your influence and your character to try to get that individual to, to change his behavior is probably going to be more influential in the long run. I think there's a difference between what would happen as a rook um, because you're still really young and stupid and did a lot of dumb things 
And as you got older, you would be corrected in a different way. I mean, th I think I would be corrected different as a first classman than I was as the stuff that I did as a rook. Yeah, I remember as a as a rook, we had you know some guys that just for whatever reason either couldn't or didn't want to conform. Well, the guys that were having trouble, if they were at least willing to accept your help, then you could help them. But if you had guys who just, you know, just wanted to fight the system, there was nothing you could do really for them um, except peer pressure. And sometimes that helped and sometimes it didn't. And there's people that are chronic knuckleheads, so you just have to deal with that. Any other questions from the audience? No. We wore them down. <laughs> I had one question that I wanted to ask. So you guys all have cadet numbers. When did you get those, and is there a significance to that number? We got them upon arrival, but I, I don't know what the reason was that I got number 17, for instance. Did it just magically uh, had not been assigned to anyone, or had the person who had it before left uh, without graduating, I don't know. They were also our mailbox number. Yeah, that was the most significant point. But uh, I, in, my, in our senior year, I got involved in that with the adjutant. Those, were, those numbers were given to the, the commandant's office and said, okay, here's, here's mailbox numbers that are not occupied because the person has left school and you would fill them in because as Wayne said, that became your mailbox number. 269 was my mailbox number. That was a hugely significant thing because that meant I got mail from someplace. Um, <clears throat> so that part was important. And you'll remember those stupid numbers the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah I used that for a lot of passwords, but you didn't hear me say that. So. <laughs> I wasn't gonna say that. But I... <laughs> All right, well, they're giving me the wrap-up sign, so it appears that's all we have time for today. Um, one thing before we go, there's the PMC lunch in the uh, Latham Hall. That's down the street. If you go down past uh, 14th Street, the next street is Walnut Street. Just turn left down there. You go past the, what is the castle, the DeFi house. Um, that Latham Hall is right there on the corner. Um, there, I think there's going to be photo opportunities outside uh, when this is done. Um, so with that, I'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for attending today. Thank you to our guests for being here. Um, I've really enjoyed this time together, and we hope you did too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right outside of the building here, we're, we will be shuttling over to Latham Hall.